All right, guys, you guys are in for a real treat this afternoon. My guest this afternoon is a versatile actor who's had an amazing career in showbiz that's lasted almost five decades. During that time, he has appeared in television shows like Canon, Hawaii Five O, The Quest, Tales from the Crypt, wow, The Trouble with Larry, Will and Grace, Spin City, to name a few. On the big screen, he has appeared alongside legends like Shirley MacLaine, Lou Gossett Jr., Charles Durning, Anne Bancroft, James Mason, Raquel Welch, Henry Winkler, and Sylvester Stallone, to name a very few. But he's probably most recognized for playing the role of Private Eye Cody Allen from 1984 to 1985 on the hit television show Riptide. He joins me today to talk about his amazing career and the crazy business in his latest film, which he made his directorial debut called The Divide. Actor, filmmaker, Mr. Perry King joins me. Perry, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time this afternoon. Yeah, I'm glad to. I, I'm looking forward to it. Um, yeah, you know, I want to start off early in your career because, you know, a lot of, a lot of people may not notice about you, but you were a, a graduated from Yale University with a degree in theater, and then you attended the Juilliard uh, School. Talk up a little bit about that if you can. Yeah, I was actually had a scholarship to uh, a school in England called Lambda. But, uh, yeah, so then I went to Juilliard instead, which was wonderful. I mean, you can't beat Juilliard for drama or for anything. And, uh, and it was run by a man named John Hausman, very famous man who had worked with Orson Welles, a real legend in Hollywood and show business. And uh, I was going to Juilliard. I was there for about three months, and I got extremely lucky and got to audition for a couple films. And I think because I was... You know, so comfortable with the idea that I was a student, and it never occurred to me I'd get anywhere with those auditions. And so I was so relaxed, I think, for that reason, that I got the jobs. Hmm. And one was The Possession of Joel Delaney. That's a movie titled with Shirley MacLaine playing hmm. her brother. Right. I, you know, Mike, it's probably still the best part I've ever had. Really? Wow. <laughs> and it was my first part. I mean, I'm playing the title lead in a movie with Shirley MacLaine, and it was basically two parts because this character I'm playing is either crazy and schizophrenic or he really is possessed by the spirit of a dead murderer. And you never really find out which, but either way, it's two totally separate identities. And I'm doing it with Shirley MacLaine. Wow. It was wonder just wonderful to me. So good to me, taught me so much. Generous. So patient with Generous. Me. Yeah, just... It's one of the, yeah, you know, that's something that I've, I've worked with a lot of real old superb pros. And, uh, and over the years, what I've noticed is the best people, the most skillful, the absolute top of the cream of the crop are the kindest and most generous mm. and most giving, which is really interesting. I mean, I, I, I spent some time once with Catherine Hepburn, who was trying to help me get a part oh, wow. in something because she was just being kind to me and um who else well you mentioned charlie durning is a good example james mason was just so good to me and so wonderful and also taught me a tremendous amount and you know these are people that that knew everything and i was just desperate to learn anything i could so uh, great I, I still i still remember i can quote things from Catherine hepburn and james mason that they said to me because i memorized them as oh, they wow. said it so I wouldn't forget it, you know. What did you learn from James Mason? Great character. Actor. Well, I'll tell you, this was his description of acting. When when we were doing this film together, a film called Mandingo, which um, was released as kind of a piece of junk by Dino De Laurentiis in, I don't know, about 77 or 6, mm. something like that. But actually, it's quite a good film. And James Mason liked it. I liked it. Uh, Dick Fleischer directed it. He was a very underrated director, one of the great directors of Hollywood ever. Mm. Um, but in any case, when I was working in this film, I, you know, as a young man and I was so obsessed with details and get everything right. And I, I'd make piles of notes and go over my notes before every scene and try to make sure I didn't miss anything. And James Mason, who was like a father to me in that film and oh, wow. so good to me, wow. uh, cause he played my father, but he really was fatherly to me. We just spent tons of time together. He, um, what he said to me is, he said, Perry, it's, it, you're, you're making it too complicated. Uh, he said, 
what, and this is a quote from him. He said, what we're paid to do is to believe that what's happening is really happening and has never happened before. And he said, it's that simple. It's not easy, but it is simple. You should keep it simple. And I trusted him completely, and I threw all my notes out and just would dive into the middle of that and try to try to, to believe that what's, what was happening in the scene was really happening. And immediately, my acting went up a big notch, the quality of it, just ratcheted it up very quickly mm. from that. And by the way, that's almost exactly what Catherine Hepburn said to me about acting. Amazing. She said, she, this is her description of what active film acting is. She said, you get a blanket idea of the character, you work off the other person, Again, these are her words, and you throw and you throw yourself into the midst of the moment. Now that's almost identical to what Mason said, and and uh, and what they're both talking about is believing. It's it's not it's not the details that count. Uh, it's it's rather embracing this fantasy that you're you're you know it's very much like the the games you play when you're a little kid you know perry in 1974 you play the role of chico terrell with henry winkle and sylvester stallone in the lords of flatbush uh yeah uh, that's a it's like a cult classic nowadays i mean one of my yes, one, one, one of my favorites and uh yeah talk about how you got that role because it's pretty interesting some backstory I, which i'll provide well i i uh back then nobody knew who i was i'd done a couple of films by then but i still was unknown and, um, you know, producers, directors, they, they didn't know who I was. So I could audition in character, which was so fun. You know, you once people know who you are and know what to expect of you a little bit, you can't do it anymore. But but it was terrific. So I went to Brooklyn. Yeah, I went over to Flatbush. I spent days hanging around. I knew I was going to audition for this part. I got a leather jacket that hmm. I wore. I, uh, I tried to become that character. So that when I walked in and met the, there were two directors of that film, Marty Davidson and Stephen Verona. And when I walked in for the audition, I was just, I, from the moment I got there, I was in character. Talking like this, you know, talk, <laughs> the, the way everybody right. talks. Like, yeah, you know. yeah. And, uh, and I just stayed in character the whole time. And I was auditioning actually for the part that Henry played. Oh, uh, Interesting. And Richard Gere was set to play the part that, that I eventually played. But then they played around with the rules and Gere moved out, I think, to do something else. Right, because, I because, ended up playing his part. And uh, I think Steve Verona said that he, you actually took over for Richard Gere. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, you're not supposed to ever ace somebody out of a job. But right. I guess without meaning to. And I'm sure Richard could care less at this point, but but uh, I knew him from acting class, and we did this improv with Susie Blakely, who uh, I'd never met her before, and Susie at that time was the hot model of the world, mm. and she's the most beautiful woman I've ever met in my life. She was then, and she still is, and I know her well. I've done maybe four or five movies with her over the years, and She's a good friend, and she's still the most beautiful woman I've ever met. Hasn't changed one bit. Still the most fun, lighthearted, easy person to be with. Tremendous enthusiasm. She's one of my favorite people on the planet. But at the time, I never met her. And Richard was there with her, and they were supposed to be boyfriend, girlfriend, and I was supposed to be the part that Henry Winkler played, and I was supposed to get them back together because they supposedly had a fight. I was... Richard's best friend. I was Chico's best friend, mm. Butchie. And uh, and I was trying to get Richard Gere to talk to her. And, and Richard, back then, was always working on this sullen, quiet character that didn't say anything. And I wasn't getting anywhere. So I finally just gave up and started talking to Susie because she was so breathtakingly beautiful. You couldn't take your eyes off her. And so charming and fun, you know. And so at the next day, they called me and they said uh, they wanted me to play... Chico and oh, wow. I, you know, it's funny because I I see those guys often, and I just really? saw Marty Davidson pretty recently. I mean, specifically those two directors, they're still very good friends. And I said to Marty, I bet I bet you wish you hadn't fired Richard Gere and got me instead, you know, because then he would have had three big stars in that movie. Oh, wow. of two. yeah, but, because a lot of stories saying that him and Stallone never got along, and there was two different personalities going at it. And well, yeah, I mean, it's it's tough because they they. Uh, 
I mean, Sly just took over that movie. Mm. Sly was brilliant, is brilliant. Sly is is the most genius like person right. I've ever met. Now I know a lot of people don't know that. They don't see right, that. Right, right. They, they might find that hard to believe, but I'm telling you. Right. I I had I went to Yale, not that that means much, but I was in the company of some very intelligent people there. And I'm telling you, Sly is the most brilliant person I've ever come in contact with. You know, I, I he, he, he gave me, we were shooting, you know, two weeks into shooting maybe, and we were in character all the time. We never dropped out of character. So I just figured Sly was the part he was playing, which is kind of a dumb Yeah, street kid, street, you know? kid, you know, street guy. Street kid. And he, one day he said to me, hey, take a look at this. I got this screenplay. Read it, will you? I want you. I want to know what you think of it. And I thought, oh, Jesus, this is going to be painful. But I took it back. And <laughs> right, I, right. And I read it. And I'm telling you, wow. like, it's still the, the most magnificent screenplay I've ever read in my life. Now, it wasn't Rocky. It was something he's never done. It was a screenplay about Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, wow. And he wrote it, I think, for himself. Um, and believe me, he could play it, but he's smart. He's so smart. He knows that the world just couldn't accept him as this writer from the 19th century. Yeah. But it's a superb screenplay. It's very long. It's like a four-hour movie. It's an extraordinary piece of work. It's still one of the best things I've ever read in my life. Hmm. But because Stallone impressed me so much and was so, and he, he would w do these improvs while we were working on scenes that would just make the scene into a whole new world. The best stuff in the Lords of Flatbush is the stuff he's in, and it's because of him. He basically wrote it, hmm. and uh, and they would take his improvs and put them in the movie, right? And during the shoot of the movie, I was so impressed by him that I took him to a lady who was my manager, uh, named Jane Oliver. Jane Oliver was managing me and Susan Sarandon and Chris Sarandon, her husband at the time. Um, and she had those three clients, and I took Stallone to her and said, you got to meet this guy. He's incredible. And she signed up Stallone, and together they did Rocky. I mean, Stallone did it. He's, he earned every bit of, of everything he got. He wrote it. What he did was he wrote, he couldn't get cast as anything. Mm. People would see, yeah. like, we went to Hollywood. After we finished shooting it, we all went to Hollywood to try and break in. We were all out there, and I remember I was tuning his old Buick up because he'd <laughs> driven out in this old Buick. He didn't have money to hire a mechanic for a tune-up even. And I used to be a mechanic in the summers at, at Yale to make some money. So I would tune his car up to just help him out. And, and one day they they uh, were looking at the Lord's for a movie called Foster and Laurie, a TV movie. And they wanted a guy to play this Staten Island Italian guy. Um, and they saw the Lords and they got interested in me because I'm a conventional looking actor and, and uh, sort of what you'd expect. Stallone, if you think of him before Rocky, he, he was extraordinary, but he was unique. You, you didn't know what to do with him. It's like nobody you'd ever seen before or come in contact with. And they saw, and they, so they offered me the part. He was at my house with Jane Oliver one day, and we knew they were debating whether to ask him or me to play this part on, on TV. And he said, All right, if you get the, uh, the part of an Italian over me, I'll F and kill you. <laughs> 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 and I did. And I took it because it wouldn't do him any good for me All to right. turn it down because they weren't going to cast him. And he understood that. He was, but so he wrote Rocky. He wrote the part he knew he could play magnificently well. And then, having written this wonderful screenplay, this something, you know, out of left field that nobody had ever visualized before, then they got, they tried to buy it from him without him in the lead part. And they got all the way up to offering him $300,000, as I remember, which by today's, in today's money, is like a million bucks. It's like a million bucks, bucks yeah. Yeah. And, he was broke. I mean, he could barely feed his wife and his uh, kids. Uh, but I know he couldn't. He, he didn't have any money, and he turned down, in effect, a million dollars. Can you imagine a screenplay 
without him. Now, of all the incredible things he did, I always thought that was the most yeah. incredible. The guts. The guts, the right, self, right, right. The, the belief in yourself that that but, exhibits. Because I'll be, I'll be honest with you, I don't think I could do that. I mean, I, I really no, don't. I couldn't. Who I could, couldn't who? in a million years. I know. Yeah, I give, give it to Ryan O'Neill. Let him play it, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he knew that he had written this for himself, and he wasn't going to give it away. It didn't matter the money. He wasn't letting that go. And so they finally did it. When when Rocky happened, I was at the first, as I remember, with Jane Oliver, and I was there with Sly sitting beside him, and and uh, and I was at I think that I think it was the first public screening of any kind they had of Rocky at one of the the, the theaters that uh, you know the old uh, professional screening rooms at MGM down in this really dirty old mm. oh. tawdry place, you know, and and. Uh, so we were the first people to ever get to see it, and we just were screaming. We were so excited because it was so damn good. Hmm. Yeah, no, he's a, he's an amazing talent, and I, I I'm gonna yeah. tie, I'm gonna tie an American myself, and he's done, you know, obviously he's done a lot for us, and uh, you know, why the oh, academy, why why the academy hasn't given him a lifetime achievement award is beyond any realm of oh, well, you the know, academy. Yeah, that's another, I mean, it's another, the, it's another show. The academy. <laughs> I've been in the academy for forty years, and the academy is. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just, a piece of work. I, yeah. I'm very frustrated by the academy. They have lost their way lately. Yes, badly. they really, really. I agree with and, you. And uh, they're, they're quickly creating, turning a, the Academy Award, in my opinion, into just yet another award of that's it. no significance whatsoever. And, and it's a shame because it, for me, it sure is. I'm I'll a big you, it's uh, sad. And we spoke before, and I'm a huge movie guy. I'm a classic movie guy, and yeah. for me, the, for me, the Oscars was the Super Bowl, and I get my spread of food, and I'd sit there. I know, and, you know, know, it was an me event. Too. It was an event for me. But me now, too. Everybody's me got too. an agenda, and they want to tell you, listen, just in, entertain me. I don't care what you. Well, they just they've lost their way. They're running scared of yeah. social changes, uh, and they don't know what to do about it. And they've lost track of what the Academy Award is, which is, and what it should be, which is an award for excellence. Right. Period. Nothing else. Nothing else should enter into it. It should be for excellence. Right. The and uh, I mean the pro you know, the pro football hall of fame doesn't doesn't let ballerinas in there. You know what I mean? Hey, I'll, I, I, really I, I, I want to go back. I'm sure real. I'll get it. I'm sure I'm going to get big trouble. There's somebody. The academy, somebody in the academy will hear I said that. They'll give me a, a rasher or crap yeah, for that. Screw that. I don't too think bad. That, that's the truth. Yeah, yeah, the truth hurts, and uh, when you let the minority, yeah. when you let the minority rule over the majority, is the problem. Uh, <laughs> I'm hoping that. Uh, they can reorient themselves. I hope so, too. We'll I hope so, too, because we, there's a lot of fans out there. And, uh, you know, you, you spoke about the Lords of Flatbush. You said you always stayed in character. You even stayed in character one night when you kicked the guy's quarter panel in. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and I mean, it, this was a low-budget film. Very to low. beat the hell out of all low-budget films. I mean, we were <laughs> Did you have we craft? Did, huh? did you even have craft services? Uh, I think they fed us some food, but I don't know exactly when. TV but we would that. change our clothes in, in the back seats of cars and stuff. I mean, you know, really low budget. Funny, every time Susie Blakely and I work together on something, we always say, we. I think we've always worked together on low budget films. And every time we say, this is it, this is the last low budget film we're ever doing. <laughs> and then we do another one together. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, so we, we were, I would just show up in my wardrobe. And I'd go home in my wardrobe, and I was uh, walking across the street very late one day. We we were shooting night stuff, and so it was like three in the morning. I was going home. I'm dressed with this leather jacket, just like in the Lords. And this guy zooms around the corner and almost hits me, and zooms his car past me. And without even thinking, I Perry King would never have done this, but this was I was still thinking like Chico Terrell and the Lords of Flatbush. And I spun around and I had this these motorcycle boots on, right? I kicked this big dent in his, in his door. <laughs> and the guy screeches to a stop and jumps out of his car. And and I said, I, you know, I can't say Yeah, it. right, I can, right. I can't say it on the radio, but <laughs> right. I, you can imagine what I said to him. And I, I scared the hell out of him. He jumped back in his car and took off. <laughs> and after he left, I said, thank you, Chico, for saving my life. Because that wasn't me. That was Chico. <laughs> that was Chico. It wasn't Perry King, believe me. <laughs> That's what you look for when you when you play a part. You hope right, right. for, for um, the part to just kind of take over and, 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 and do the job for you. I, I want to talk real quick. A lot of people don't know this about that movie. That, that You're a big motorcycle enthusiast. Um, you know, you've been in... A lot of you know stuff with motorcycles. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but in that film, you actually rode two different micro uh, motorcycles. 
Yes, what happened was we had initially a chopper, an old right. fire spitting chopper, Harley chopper, right? And uh, they left it parked outside one somebody's office overnight in Manhattan. And to their shock and astonishment, the next day it was gone. Of course it was gone. I don't know what they were thinking. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, so they had to get another a bike, and they and they found somebody with a proper, the right time frame, you know, 50s Harley, but a dresser, which is a totally different, anybody who knows bikes, a dresser is a totally different bike. I mean, it doesn't even remotely look like the same motorcycle, even though it's a Harley. And I said, you can't do that. That I'm playing this kid who doesn't have two dimes to rub together. How would I ever have two motorcycles? Right, continuity. Let alone continuity. Even one. And everybody, the, the, Marty Davidson and Steve Marilla, they both said, don't worry, nobody will ever notice. And sure as hell, nobody ever notices that I'm on two totally different motorcycles. <laughs> Why? This, this, I'm playing this kid who doesn't have 10 cents to his name. I don't even know how I paid for one. He's got a trust, he's got a trust fund. They didn't tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that you and Henry Winkler, both being Yale graduates, would have gotten these roles? If they, if they, they no. knew? And, and again, as I was saying, we were always in character. I don't think they ever knew really who any of us were in our own lives. And Henry and I one day went to Stephen, I think. The movie was sort of based on Stephen's life, and I was playing him as a young man, Stephen Verona. And uh, we said, Stephen, do you realize you can't? But we said it like in character, you know. I said, Stephen, you know, did you ever think about the fact that you, you cast two Yaleys as your hoods, <laughs> your Brooklyn hoods? And he thought we were just, we were screwing with him, you know. <laughs> I remember the actor who played Susie's father in that. He just had a job for one day, and I, I also told him that. I said, yeah, I, I graduated from Yale. Yeah, I got a B.A. from Yale. Yeah, sure you and did. He, <laughs> 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 but, you know, Yale, it means nothing to go to Yale. Some of the smartest people I ever knew in my life were at Yale, and some of the dumbest people I ever knew in my life <laughs> I met at Yale. So yeah. it, it's, it's, it's the same as everywhere. Right. Everywhere is a mixture of up and down, good and bad, smart and dumb. Folks, joining me on the phone is legendary actor Perry King. He has an incredible movie out called The Divide, which you can check it out at the, 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 excuse me, the website, the thedividemotionpicture.com, which we're going to get into in a little bit. Perry, in 1977, you play the role of Baxter Slate alongside Lou Gossett Jr. and Charles Durning. Call it movie mm -hmm. called the, a very underrated movie, in my opinion, one of my favorites, uh, The Choir Boys. Talk a little bit about that and working with those giants. Yeah. God, they sure are. Uh, Charlie's gone now, but uh, yeah, but, uh, very quick. Charlie, particularly, Charlie, Charlie st stormed the beaches of Normandy. Uh, by the he way, he did, he did exactly right, and uh, he told me about that. The the uh, I think I did, I think Charlie and I were in all together three different film projects together. Oh, wow. but that was one of them, of course, uh, and I think that was the first that we. I'm not sure if it was the first or not because we were in a mini series called. Uh, called uh, Captains and the Kings, which was a big hit miniseries in the late 70s. And uh, so I, I think that came before Choir Boys. But in any case, so Choir Boys is, um, you know, Joseph Wambaugh wrote the book and Robert Aldrich, Aldrich directed it. And I, the screenplay was terrific and filled with so much substance and, and value. But... Um, interestingly enough, Charlie, I, I wanted to tell you ahead, Charlie, it's yep. something most people don't know about Charlie Durning. There's a lot of stuff people don't realize about Charlie Durning. He was, it was a dog, you know, day, dog, all, day, after, you, dog you, day afternoon. Yeah. And you see him and he always looks so heavy, so big. In fact, he was one of the most agile, athletic, incredibly physical people I've ever known. He was a beautiful dancer, a ballroom oh, dancer. Wow. Wow. Um, but Charlie told me when he was a young man, he he was in the first wave, as I remember, uh, at Normandy. Wow. In D-Day. And he was in the LST, I think they were called, yes, those yes, landing the craft. Yes, Yeah, but the gate. And he, and he said he was a, packed in there with a bunch of kids. He said they were all 18, 19, 20 years old. And he said and they all knew they were dead. I mean, they knew it. There was no doubt in their minds. They were dead men just waiting. And he said with the front flap of that thing flapped down, he said immediately the guy, the kid right in front of him and the kid right behind him, both of them just disintegrated. Jeez, wow. And he's, yeah, can you imagine? imagine. And he started, he said he just started walking forward into the water and up the beach. 
he just, he knew he was dead. He was just waiting to die. Mm. He wasn't even trying to survive because he knew there was no hope. Wow. And he said a couple days later, he finally realized he was alive. He'd survived it, by sheer chance, he said. Pure accident. No explanation at all for it other than chance. But he didn't die. Yeah. But he, I, I think he said almost every one of those men in that landing craft he was in were dead wow. right away. Yeah, amazing. It's, it's an amazing story. Yeah, he's a, one, yeah. Of the, one of the greats, and a lot of people don't know that about yeah, him. Yeah, one of the absolute greats. Yeah, God, what a nice, what a good man, too. A good-hearted yeah. man. Seemed, seemed like a honorable. jovial. Seemed like a jovial kind of guy, you know? Yeah. Well, he was jovial, I think, because what he he'd been through yeah. tough stuff. And and he was grateful to still be around and, and really felt lucky that he had what he had in his life, which is a terrific career and family. And, you know, I mean, he was jovial because he'd earned it. Yeah. Very, very Definitely one of the one of the good guys I've ever known. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Riptide, Perry. Uh, you did it. You did it for mm-hmm. 56 episodes. Um, talk about how you even got that role. And in- Riptide was uh, one of the luckiest things that ever happened to me. And I fought hard to get the job, but I'm still really lucky I managed to get it. And uh, it was, you know, so much fun. The only trouble with Riptide was we were working so hard mm. that after a while you just felt like you'd been run over by two trucks. That was the one downside to that show was we worked so hard. We'd do 12, 14-hour days. We'd have, we had, you know, good hours commute on either end of that. Then you'd have to learn the lines for the next day, and you had no time for any kind of personal life. I was a single guy during Riptide, and I remember uh, every week there'd be these beautiful women on the show, but there was nothing you could do about it <laughs> because you, you didn't have any time. <laughs> it was it was so painful. You know, it's like starving in a chocolate. Yeah, doing network television. Shop or something. Network network <laughs> television is not good for relationships. Oh my god, it was so brutal the schedule. Mm. Just just relentless that schedule. You were never comfortable with being that pretty boy because in your, you know you're in your youth you're a very handsome gentleman you know don't take this the wrong way but <laughs> no no you're right you're um, absolutely right that's the word that described me back then was pretty right and for that reason there were a lot of things that I just couldn't break through and get cast as you know I always wanted more than anything to do westerns and uh, and but I just never could get cast as them because I was so pretty looking you know I just didn't fit in the minds of people. Mm. And I, I don't disagree with him. I, I probably wouldn't have cast me either. Mm, interesting. Uh, Finally, no, I'm, I, I solved that problem now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, age. Uh, it gets I'm it. 71, and, and I'm pretty pretty craggy and and line now, and that's great. I'm no longer no longer have to worry about being too pretty. <laughs> God bless you, um, Perry. Uh, great segue. We're talking about a western. You know, this is your baby. You, you did a film called The Divide. Talk about that, and just you know, talk about how it came to fruition. Well, you know, a lot of it, and I, whenever I talk about the Lords of Flatbush or Sylvester Stallone or any of that stuff, or Jane Oliver, who died very young, God, we all mourned Jane Oliver, my manager who was Sly's manager, we oh. just, everybody loved that woman. She was so, God, one of the finest people of my life. But, but in any case, whenever I talk about that, I realize that without really consciously thinking too much about it, Doing the divide, I was very much inspired by what Sly did because I finally decided a few years ago that if I'm going to play the part that I want to play, I I got to quit waiting for Hollywood to give it to me. I'm just going to have to do it myself. So I decided to do my own film, and I met this this wonderful writer named Canna Brown who lives in Concord, New Hampshire. Mm. We, we we did something together um, right up the street just from on us. the phone. Yeah. Yeah, we did something. Well, the reason it's it's a sort of sort of an interesting backstory because she was working at a school that I had gone to, a prep school that I'd gone to many years before she was working there called St. Paul's in Concord, New Hampshire. Okay. And she was looking for alumni that would be interesting to write stories about for the alumni magazine. And she called me and uh, she said, I'd like to talk to you about, you know, your time at St. Paul's and what you think of the school and I said, you got the wrong guy. You know, the school doesn't want to hear what I think of that school because I didn't like that school. <laughs> <laughs> I got a good education there, but I was miserable there. And in any case, so she said, well, let, let's just do a bio of you, a story about you, about your career, because you're a graduate. So we did that. And by the time we finished that, we'd had such 
such a good time doing that. We said, let's do something else together. Something. What can we do together? And she, you know, she wrote this thing beautifully. She did an amazing thing that nobody else has ever done. I've done hundreds of interviews, I'm sure. Nobody's ever, ever quoted me accurately before Jana Brown. She's the only person who actually wrote down what I said and quoted me. You know, so that I felt like I was reading my own words. You mean the newspapers didn't do it? <laughs> <laughs> Never. Not even right. close. Many a time I've done interviews with people, not like we're doing right now, but I right. mean, where they, they write down what you're saying and they quote you. Many a time I've had my quotes be almost the exact opposite of what I said. You know, it's very frustrating because you can't do anything about it. But in any case... So Janet said, what have you always wanted to do? What can we do together? And I said, well, I've always wanted to make my own movie. And, uh, and so we started talking about that. And she'd never written a screenplay. And I said, let's just do it. Let's see how far we get. And we started working on this thing. And we got farther and farther along. It looked better and better. And finally, one day we said, are we going to do this or just play around with it? And we decided, no, we're going to do it. We're going to actually make this movie. And then I have a friend named Russ Rayburn, who is a cinematographer, he'd always wanted to be the cameraman, the cinematographer for a feature. Never had done that. He'd been hmm. the cinematographer for a lot of things, but not a feature. So um, so we all three decided we're going to do this. And it took us years and tremendous effort. And we're still, it's still an ongoing process because I'm still working on getting it out there. You know, like just last weekend, I was up in Napa Oh, wow. in, uh, in St. Helena, actually north of San Francisco, and showing it at a, an event up there, and we've been in lots of festivals, and, you know, um, we're slowly getting it out there, well, so it's been finished what, for a what while. Was the re- what was the reception at Cannes? Because I know it's showed at Cannes. Yeah, we, we, got, we always seem to get a very positive reaction to this film. People like it very much. I think what they like about it is just what we wanted it to be, which is... It's a very old-fashioned movie. It's very much out of step with Hollywood movies these days. Uh, there's no quick cutting. There's no jagged filming. Uh, it's black and white. It's very old-fashioned. It's about real people. The what? drama of ordinary life. You know, it's a film that because it's basically might... it's a western in black and white. Why the black and white? Well, because all almost all the films I've loved over the years have been in black and white. And uh, but the best example of that probably is a film with Paul Newman called HUD. Oh yes, HUD? Absolutely. absolutely. Okay, so that film made a big mark of me when I was a kid and I saw that film. But but uh, many other black and white films. I just love the look of black and white, and black and white fits this film perfectly. This film is set in the biggest drought in California history before 2015, which was the year we shot it up here, actually. But before that, the biggest drought took place in 1976. And we set it in that drought. We shot it on my cattle ranch up in the Sierra Nevada. Mm. Um, I figured, let's, we, you know, let's make a movie on my own land. That way I'm not likely to have a fight with the landowner. <laughs> <laughs> Save some cash. You know, he's, he's, he's probably going to go along with me. <clears throat> and, uh, and we did. We shot it on my, on my ranch. And how did you uh, co- how did you come up with the title the divide? Well, the area I live in is called the divide by the local community. I'm right by the American River. The American River comes out of the mountains. I'm right in Gold Country, right probably 15 minutes from where they discovered gold in 1848. And uh, the American River comes out in three tributaries, and and so it makes two pie shaped chunks of land that are kind of isolated. Each one of them. And there's the Forest Hill Divide and the Georgetown Divide. And I, my ranch is on the Georgetown Divide. So everybody up here calls it the Divide. They say, I'm going home to the Divide, or I live on the Divide. And that name fit not only the territory, but it fits perfectly with, you know, it's a double entendre. It fit, fits the story, too, because mm. there's a divide between the characters. Um, but like Rocky, it's a redemption movie. It's a movie about actually four separate characters who all need redemption. Uh, they're seeking redemption for something. And I always love that theme more than any other because, and there aren't a lot of themes, you know, there's only a few themes really. And uh, that the theme of redemption is always the one that sings the most 
to me and I think to most people because who the hell doesn't need redemption for something? That's right. Mm. You know, so we all understand it so well. And that's what rang so true of Rocky was, uh, you know, Rocky's getting redemption. Talk about some of the challenges for you being a first-time director. Well, uh, it, it's first of all, it's very difficult to direct yourself because it's very schizophrenic. Right, because you starred in it as well, obviously. Yeah, I did. And so luckily, now we wrote it so that I'm only in about 50%, 60% of it, you know, because I wanted a big chunk of time where I'd be directing without the burden of also being in the scenes. And when you're in the scenes, it's very tough. You you uh, you want to be watching what's happening and keeping track of the other actors. At the same time, that's antithetical to to good acting. But luckily, I had a long time to prepare, which you don't usually get in Hollywood. Not nearly long enough. So by the time we came to shoot, I felt like I actually really knew exactly who my character was, and I could almost open a door in my head and he'd walk out and do stuff, you know, which is what you want. I remember the Lords of Flatbush to go back way back to then. Mm. The day we finished shooting, I remember very clearly thinking, okay, good. I'm finally ready to begin. And it was over, right? <laughs> <laughs> the whole shoot had sort of been my preparation for getting ready to play the part. Uh, in this case, the day we started shooting, I really knew who Sam, my character, was, is. And, uh, and there are a number of scenes in the movie where I would do stuff that I hadn't thought of, that I, Perry, never thought of. I would just, we'd roll the camera, I'd say action, and then Sam would just do stuff. Uh, I remember there's a scene where I wake up at night, I get up, I'm an old man, I'm falling apart, I've got a lot of physical problems. The film is in part about Alzheimer's. Right. Cause Sam has, has, has the, uh, experiencing the onset of Alzheimer's, and as the film goes on, it gets more and more severe. Uh, but back in 76, when nobody knew what that was, the, the term Alzheimer's wasn't in the conventional conversation of the time. I mean, that term was only used in hospitals maybe not mm. in in public so uh back then there was no sympathy for it no support for it no understanding of it at all so we've got a long way to go with it these days but we're better than we were back then yeah and but, a, lot of, but, a lot of times they would, they would say well he's he's losing it you know yeah exactly he's getting soft right say, or, though, about the most scientific thing anybody would say is he's senile which doesn't actually mean anything, mm. you know, that there's nothing in that term. But anyway, so when we started shooting, there was a scene where I wake, I get up in the middle of the night, and I got up, and the first thing I did, now I didn't think of this, this was not a conscious choice, this is what you hope for as an actor, I got up, and the first thing I did was I put my hat on. <laughs> <laughs> and after we, you know, we shot that, and I cut the camera and said, cut the scene, and I thought, God, that's exactly right, that's exactly what an old cowboy, a guy that's been running cows in the West his whole life. That's Cowboys do that. They they love right. their hat. Their right, hat is right. a big deal. It's by them. their personality. It's by their personality. You know, and that's exactly what Sam would do. Is he'd get up before he put his pants on. He'd put his hat on. <laughs> Speaking of old Cowboys, um, you, you like you say, you watched a lot of Westerns when you were younger. Uh, a, lot yeah. of the, a lot of the actors back then, they didn't know how to get on a horse. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, if you want to know if somebody can ride a horse... I, you know, it's actually, they don't make many Westerns anymore. And yeah, unfortunately. One of the, maybe the principal reason for that, I think, is who are we going to cast? Who the right. hell are you going to cast in a Western? Tom Cruise? You know, it's not going to work. It's <laughs> right. not going to cut it. But the old guys, when you watch the old guys, the way you get on a horse properly is you take your left hand, put it on, on the, the mane of the horse, you know, holding the reins. You grab the horn of the of the saddle with your right hand and you step into the saddle that way. And the reason you do it that way is because then you're pulling the saddle back against the horse's back, which is not hard for the horse. It's comfortable. He can brace against that easily. Most most people get on it wrong. They get on it by grabbing the horn with their left hand, holding the reins, and the back of the saddle, the cantle, with mm. their right hand. And then you're pulling the saddle off sideways. And that's hard for the horse. You pull them off balance. Right. And that's right. why. Huh. So, uh, in fact, in, I intentionally get on my horse wrong at one point because Sam's getting 
so old and creaky that he can't get on his horse anymore. Mm. So I kind of hated to do it, but I wanted to get on the wrong way. But if you're watching a, a modern day Western, and you want to know if somebody really knows what they're doing. Mm. Just watch the way they get on their horse. Mm. Watch the old Westerns from the 30s right, and right. 40s, you know, and you won't see anybody grab the, the cantle of the saddle with their right hand. Not Inter- anybody. Interesting. interesting. Uh, yeah. Perry, this is your baby. Like I said, you're very passionate about it. What is the message that you hope that somebody who watches this movie comes from? What, what do you think the message they hope that you hope comes out of this? Well, this is what I think movies should be about, which is ordinary life, real people. I'm very frustrated with Hollywood because Hollywood makes movies about superheroes, people who fly around with capes and stuff. Yeah, there's no more action. <laughs> and and it's not what it's not what the films that I grew up loving, the films of the thirties, forties, fifties were about, you know, and I miss those old time yeah. films. So this is a film for anybody who, who misses the old time films. Mm. You know, a, a, a line we found for to explain the film is it's a new film with old values. I like it. The old values of the old days. But I'll tell you the message that, that I always say, I do a lot of Q&A these days. I'll screen the movie at festivals or at a theater or something, and people like to ask me questions about it. And I say to everybody, the thing I want you to leave tonight with is this thought. If you've got in your head something you've always wanted to do, and just about everybody does, has a dream in there. They think, someday I'm going to do this. Someday I'm going to get a boat and sail off into the ocean or someday I'm going to, you know, take a trip or someday I'm going to start painting or whatever you got. Do it, do it and do it now. Cause mm. it's so satisfying. I, it took me 50 years to do my own movie, my wow. dream. And I was, I was thinking about my own movie. God, even when we did the Lords, I was thinking someday oh. I'm going to make my own movie. Mm. It took me 50 years to get there, mm. but I'm telling you, I'm so glad I did it. That's, I just they, wish I'd done it sooner. Do you know if Sly seen it? Have seen it? No, I don't think he has, actually. Mm. Uh, up in, I was just in Bozeman at the film, the Montana Film Festival in Bozeman with it, and I ran into a wonderful lady named Andrea Eastman, who had been Jane Oliver's assistant at one point and worked oh, wow. with Jane Oliver, and, and she's uh, Sly's... Uh, agent i think at this point or one of his agents or used to be his agent anyway she so she she texted sly and he sent a text back and said he wants to see it sometime and oh fantastic. so we communicated that way so you know someday i'm sure he'll get a chance to see it mm. if he wants but uh, where can but, uh, where can people my you know he's a he's a horseman did you know that no i did i did not know that because he yeah made, he plays he's uh, a polo player and a horse oh yeah you're player. right i remember watching he like, used to be yeah he, he used to do the old magazine uh magazine print work for uh what the hell was it there the one the sh- uh boss hugo boss on a polo horse i remember seeing those. oh yeah i remember yeah. that stuff wow yeah amazing very so one of people in my audience want to can see that want to see this movie where can they go see it well it's still we're just getting it out there but by the fall it will definitely be on all the digital platforms so excellent, you'll be able to excellent. get it on amazon and hulu and all that stuff it'll be available there and you can you you can find out about any of that from the website yeah the divide motion picture yeah i'm gonna blast that on social media and right then here. in feature films i mean in features in uh in theatrical i'm just going around four walling it myself Mm. Uh, which is not the way you're supposed to do it, but it's the way I want to do it, which is I'm just literally going to individual theaters and setting it up to show it at those theaters and showing it up in the screenings, you know, and traveling around like a medicine man selling <laughs> snake oil. <you> know? <laughs> do, you th- do you think you're going to make more of your own pitches down the road? Or do you, uh, ah, you yeah, know, it's I, a lot of work. I'm tempted to quit while I'm ahead because I'm so <laughs> happy with this movie. Right. You know how... How athletes they retire, and that often an athlete will retire. It'll come right back. When he's at the peak, right? <laughs> yeah. And you think, perfect, that's just great. You're walking away at just the right time, and then they come back, <laughs> and they're no good anymore. You so I think yeah. to myself, you know what? I should just walk away right now. Right. Just leave it at that. I've, right. I've been doing this for 50 years. Wow, God bless you. Uh, yeah, I should yeah. probably just quit while I'm ahead. Well, you should be very, very proud of yourself because I'm sure it's, a, it's a phenomenal, uh, you know, it's a very passionate thing that you did, and you brought it to the big screen. Well, and, uh, folks, I'm telling you, anybody who's listening to us right now, if you've got a dream that you want, like, don't put it off anymore. Yeah, life you is know, very, the life, last thing you want to be doing is lying on your deathbed thinking, yeah. son of a gun, I never I did know. it. Don't I mean, let that happen. 
for as long it. for as long as the world's been out there, we're you, we're only we're lucky if we're here for a hundred years and then. Oh. Very tiny Jeez. period of time. Yeah, very tiny. And man, I don't know about you, but <laughs> at this point, I know a lot more dead people than living people. Well, I'm losing friends right and left oh, right now. Oh, goodness. All right, folks, the great Perry King, folks. If you get a chance to see this film, check out his website, the thedividemotionpicture.com. Follow Perry on social media. He's one of the greats in the business, one of the nice guys in the business, and um, one of the nice, nice guys, very talented. Uh, Really get behind this, and we'll be looking for this on the on the social media, on the platforms, the movie platforms down the road. And um, Perry, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. I enjoyed it. Uh, God bless you, and uh, continue success. You too. All right, folks, and there you have it. The great Perry King, one of the nicest gentlemen in the business, in my opinion. I've done over 200 interviews, and he's one of the tops, one of the best in the business. And um, sometimes you get a lot of celebrities come on, you got to stroke their egos a little bit. And uh, Perry's, Perry's one of the absolute gentlemen. Uh, visit his website, the thedividemotionpicture.com. This film is uh, critically getting critical acclaim at Cannes Film Festival. It's playing at film festivals across the country, like he said, and pretty soon it's going to be up on the Hulus and the Netflixes, on the Amazon Primes. It's going to be up there soon. And uh, get behind this film. It's an independent film. It's one of his passions, like he, like he said, like Rocky was for Sylvester Stallone. This is his Rocky. So check it out, The Divide TheDivideMotionPicture.com. I'm going to be blasting this all over social media. And uh, get behind this for Perry, because Perry's one of the nicest people in the business. And like I say... Um, great 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 film and uh so that's our show for this week folks